Hi, I'm Michael Turton. Welcome back to another edition of this podcast. I'm here today with Solomon Temuo, the CEO and founder of Playarian, a gaming company here in Taipei. And I'm also here with Sean Su, uh, an ardent gamer and computer guy and tech geek and general all-around talent. And we're going to have a wonderful talk about Taiwan and the gaming ecology here and all the things that make life wonderful for gamers. So welcome. Hey, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great to be here. All right. So I don't even know where to start. <laughs> <laughs> Solomon, uh, you're the CEO and founder of Playarium. That's right. That's How right. long have you been around in this this so, company? So um, Playarium was founded in uh, May 2015. Um, I always get that mixed up. I always say March. <laughs> and my, my co-founders, you know, always look at me funny. But um, it was started in May uh, 2015. Uh -huh. So it's been around for almost uh, six years. Um, five and a half years, I would say now. What did you do before in the game industry? So I've been working in games for almost uh, 16 years. Mm -hmm. um, I actually started out as an artist back in the UK, 3D artist, working uh -huh. on 3D environments, uh, vehicles for a company called Sumo Digital. And I was working on Outrun uh, 2006, Coast to Coast. That was back for the PSP. That's probably before a lot of your time. Uh, <laughs> so I was back for the PSP. Hey, I remember 386 computers. <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> so that was a PSP, um, Xbox, uh, PlayStation 2. And, um, and then um, after that, um, I, I, I worked at Traveler's Tales in uh, Manchester. Um, I worked there for about uh, a year. Uh -huh. before flying off to um, Amsterdam in the Netherlands to work at Sony uh, Guerrilla Games. Mm -hmm. Worked on Killzone 2, uh, Killzone 3. Oh, sorry. I, the game I worked on when I was in Traveler's Tales was uh, Lego Star Wars 2. Lego Star Wars. Yeah, Lego Star Wars. I was um, environment artist and level setup, so a little bit of design, uh -huh. just, just a little bit. And then um, uh, moved to Amsterdam to work um, for Guerrilla Games, which is a company owned by Sony. Uh -huh. And I worked on uh, Killzone 2 and uh, Killzone 3 for PlayStation 3. Um, I started out there as an artist, but transitioned into uh, being a producer and um, you know, started to help them to build up their um, outsourcing um, pipeline, sending packages of work to companies around the world, one of them being um, in China. And um, back then, um, I think we were one of the first games companies to openly embrace outsourcing. Not many games companies were outsourcing their, their work. It was something that was a, seemed to be like a dirty word among some other companies, but um, you know, Guerrilla embraced it and a few other studios, studios embraced it. Um, I worked there for about three years and then I did a little bit of time on um, Little Big Planet um, at Media Molecule and um, flew off to Hong Kong and I worked for a Chinese manufacturing company, uh, sorry, Chinese arcade manufacturing company called Wallup. Um, they opened a studio called Insoft um, in Hong Kong. So I was helping them to uh, manage and build up their Hong Kong team on a new racing game, uh -huh. new IP, um, new game engine. And I was traveling between Hong Kong and Guangzhou. Um, 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 I was spending half my week in Hong Kong, half my week in Guangzhou, managing um, two teams, building up two teams. And then I left there um, and I joined a company, a Taiwanese company called Xpec and moved to mainland China, Suzhou. Mm -hmm. And I was their VP of production and studio art director. So basically that meant that I was, um, any project that was coming in, I was looking at the project, um, assigning it out to other art directors, making sure that it was you know, profitable for the company, but also trying to keep the quality high. And um, I worked there for almost uh, five years before I left and opened a studio in Taiwan uh, back in 2015. So, wow. Yeah. Well, that's a lot of AAA titles. <laughs> <laughs> Those are just a few of them. Uh, it's, there's, quite a, there's quite a bit. Um, oh, there. There's even more AAA titles. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you can Google it. I, I, I've been credited on games like uh, Bloodborne, um, Uncharted, uh, The Last of Us, Killzone. Four, uh, Horizon Zero Dawn, um, Dragon's Dogma, Resident Evil Revelations 2, the, the list goes on. Yeah. 
Wow. Are, are there any AAA games you haven't worked on? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's loads. <laughs> I think there's like three of them, right? <laughs> so why did you choose Taiwan over all the, I mean, why not China? Why not? Yeah, so that's, a, that's an interesting question. It's a, it's, a, it's a good question. I think at that time, back in 2015, when I was looking around to think about what am I going to do um, next, um, I looked at, I did look at China as an option and there were some very strong pros there. But at the time, um, me being a foreigner and the maturity level of Taiwan's, uh, sorry, China's um, um, uh, process of foreigners wanted to open, like, you know, games companies oh, right. back then, yeah. um, it didn't seem like it was viable for me. And then the other thing as well was that, you know, the studio that, I, I wanted to open at that time was m very much focused on procedural workflows, automation, and combining that with um, creativity, um, and 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 wor really working with the studios to help them figure things out, not just um, following a set of points that was listed on a piece of paper. You know, sitting with them, trying to understand their difficulties. So I felt that um, Taiwan had the right level of um, how can I say, um, uh, creative education, you know, in their schools, they always want to be creative. They always right. want to exercise their creativity. So I, feel, I felt in Southeast Asia, they had the right level of, of create, um, creativity. That's not to say the other countries don't, they do. Um, but this is a multi-part reason, right? So one of them was, okay, they ticked the box for, you know, the creativity level. The other one was about their geographical position. Um, as a foreigner, it was a lot more easier for me to gain access and come to Taiwan and coordinate with other foreigners inside and outside of Taiwan while still being able to reach other parts of Southeast Asia if necessary. Right. Um, and also the West, you know, Europe and the US. And Taiwanese also are somewhat more familiar with, you know, Japanese um, culture as well as Western culture. So they've got a little, a little bit more familiarity there. The other thing as well is... Uh, internet infrastructure uh, <laughs> Taiwan's internet is very very good yeah. and um, having, speaking from experience uh, we sometimes work with very very large files and these files are huge and the last thing you want is just to be watching a progress bar you know slowly fill up over a period of 48 hours it's, it's not a nice feeling so um, it's very you know it's very robust and then there's the IP protections, copyright protections, um, recognition of, of, of global kind of copyright laws. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think I've listed all of it. I mean, that, that, was, that was the main reasons of, of opening. So ge geographical location, mm. um, infrastructure, education. Oh, and stability. Um, you know, um, I have to say that we've had very low um, turnover um, ourselves. We've experienced that. That's, that's very good for us. And um, Taiwan has been has been very good um, for that for us. Mm. Have, having worked in uh, so many other uh, in so many other nations, mm -hmm. um, is there one particular thing that you think really stands out as an advantage for Playerium just by being in Taipei here? Um, I think. Um, there's a there's a multi part there. Um, one, of course, is is time zone. Um, you know, sometimes when we're working with our clients in the West, um, you know, while they sleep, we can keep going, and we don't observe some of the same holidays. Right. So we can keep the the right. the, 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 the the process going while they're while they're doing their thing. But that also means that we have to have a certain level of of trust from our from our partners from our clients where they can trust us to be kind of okay. You guys are self sufficient. You can just keep going. And fortunately for us, we're in that position where they can they can do that. Um, the other thing I think as well is a bit more understanding uh, of um, uh, maybe Western or Japanese cultures or the way to communicate with them, oh. because um, you know it can be it can be. I understand from a Western's point of view that you're sending out work um, that might be about you know, a certain city in the West and you're worried that, you know, it's going to some country in Southeast Asia and are they going to understand what makes these cultural values important, right? Mm. And I think um, Taiwan does have enough understanding of it as well as um, trying to do research and re be respectful, you know, of it. 
So I think there's there's something to be said there as well. And there is talent here in Taiwan. I think that's a that's that's a, a, a thing I should say. Like there's a lot of talented um, people um, here in, in Taiwan. It's just um, you know scale. It's not. It's it's just not as big a country as some other countries. So mm-hmm. you're just working on a on. You don't have access to as uh, an, as the same number of of resources. Um, then the other thing as well is. Um, I've said talent, I've said um, creativity, but I think also they offer, um, just like other countries, they offer a alternative outlook or perspective on things. And you always want to have this cognitive diversity, right? You want to have, you want to bring us, us a wider range of creative cognitive diversity to the table so you can really round out um, your vision. So you can really round out the solutions that you want to, that you want to offer. And I think that, um, you know, from what I've seen, you know, Taiwan has, a really healthy amount of this interesting uh, cognitive diversity as to how they approach um, solutions. And, you know, again, it's it's quite easy to talk with um, uh, people in Taiwan. It's, you know, it's pretty pretty straightforward. It works out. It works out. I, yeah. I personally think um, over the last decade that I've been in Taiwan that there's been a dramatic change mm. uh, and there's definitely a lot more developing uh, 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 students developing towards a more international outlook when it comes to creativity and so on. It's kind of funny that you mentioned Taiwan having these uh, uh, people who are very creative, you said, uh, because the, it seems to be the stereotype that a lot of the graduates in Taiwan, they, they tend to be, you know, all they care about is tests in our educational <laughs> system. All they care about is, and that's it, you know, you have people who are in their 50s still talking about their their high school or college <laughs> entrance <laughs> tests. Uh, so I, I think to some of our listeners, it's going to be quite a, a, a shock to them maybe that uh, you're talking about all this creativity, but personally haven't been to Yodex or haven't been to um, the Taipei Game Show, not to be confused with Tokyo Game Show, uh, <laughs> that there, there is a lot of indie developers that are building all this great stuff. Yes, yeah, yeah you, you, you've, you've struck something there like, um, I attended a few student showcases um, mm. in in Taiwan to see, you know, what 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 are the universities kind of kind of pumping out? What what do the graduates kind of look like? And um, you know, these graduates get you know churned out. Um, I don't mean that in a bad way. They get you know released. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, and you know, you see really interesting work, really interesting experimentations, and then they you know get into the workplace and it gets hammered out of them. <laughs> you know, and um, or or you know they're told that um, the creative pursuit that they are pursuing um, is not valuable. You know, yeah. whether it's from a family member, from yeah. a friend, yeah. there is no hope. So common, this, right? So common. And so you know they go away and they maybe they go and get a job in a bank. There's nothing wrong with the jobs in the bank. If you want to do that, you do that. If not, if it's not something you want to do, or you think that it's something you it's it's not going to help your family, then okay, fine. You know, I I, I get that. I've had um, many different employees, one, one employee in particular who, who worked for us. And I, I, if I remember correctly, you know, he was, he was like a material engineer or he has a degree or PhD in chemical science or something like this. Mm, wow. And he wanted to be a concept artist, you know, <laughs> and <laughs> he'd ne- he just drew in his spare time, you know, it just, you know, in his spare time, but he really didn't like it. He, he was pushed to do it by his family and he applied. And we sat him down. We looked at his work, and I and um, I was like, okay, you know, you, you've you've got a lot of potential, and um, let's give it a shot. It's not going to be easy, and he understood that. And um, and I would say that how he has evolved today and where he is today now, he's now got a full time job, you know, working as a concept artist in the gaming oh, industry, wow. and his work is so his work is so good. But there's many stories like this that I can I can tell. But the word here, the key word here about Taiwan is that potential. And I feel that there is not enough space, support, and encouragement to help people fulfill that potential. Potential. You mentioned about the indie um, industry, the indie games, right? Yes. Yeah. And when I first got here and I was looking at Taiwan, it kind of reminded me about Japan when they first had their, not first, when their indie industry was really picking up. I think, I, mm. 
this number is completely wrong, but it might have been back in, I think, the early 2000s where people started to see, oh, hey, you know, the Japanese indie game scene is really, really picking up. Mm. And I think Taiwan is, 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 is where Japan was way back then. Mm. And in order for it to, to reach its potential, to realize its potential, it needs the support. I mean, you look at places like Canada, they have like a, uh, an incentive, right, a, a subsidy grant, um, for for gaming companies, I believe the UK also has one, and Australia has one, and different places in in Europe, France has one, but Taiwan doesn't really have it. And I know they have subsidies and grants, mm. um, but yep. the idea, the way that the subsidy works is um, most of these developers have to put in their money; they have to match it, which is kind of different from how subsidies work in other places like the West or, or, or UK or US. Um, maybe it's more like a grant and you get the money and you don't have to match it for most of them. They just right. give you the money. You just got to hit your targets. Right? Yeah. And they also try to help you hit those targets. So I think that maybe the, the, um, this, the, the way that the subsidies work um, needs to be rethought. Another thing I might uh, w would like to say is for maybe the subsidies should be tailored to uh, adapted and tailored for specific industries because mm. maybe the way the subsidy and the way you apply for it for semiconductors won't really work for gaming yeah and the way that you apply for it maybe for if you want to open a retail shop might not work when you want to make a movie right right you know um because these are very um creative enterprises where you have to iterate a lot on an idea yeah. It's not that the first idea pops in your head, you, you do it, right? It's yeah. like, you know, if you want to make a cup of coffee, there's a very simple SOP there. You, 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 you mix the water, it's done, right? But if you have a very new idea and you're trying to create that, you have to go through a few iterations. You have to talk, you have to brainstorm, you have to sketch, and there's so many different um, dependencies there. Mm. Oh, yeah. I, I, I definitely think... Um as you said, there probably should be reforms for, uh, uh, you know, getting getting that uh, support to get more of those games out. Because, you know, you said you started uh, with this company, you founded it 2015, was that? Correct. Which actually is the perfect time because uh, for those of you who are interested in games that come out of Taiwan, uh, Opus mm. uh, is a mobile game, very famous, came out in 2015. Yeah. Uh, there's also Detention that was 2017. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think Voez, V O E Z, Correct. that was 2016. Most of those are Rayarch Studios. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Rayarch, which is, uh, you know, um, also with their uh, Melody games, I think. Correct. Also Demo. All around that yeah. time. So. And um, they had, uh, Rayarch also has Implosion, and then Detention is Red Candle Games. Yeah. Um, and, but again, you know, we're only naming a few. Yes. Right. And, <laughs> so, yeah. But but there's but there's some there's, there's some other studios, you know, that are doing some good stuff. There's uh Vigil, um Longest Night, um being published by another indie. Uh, great great couple of people, great, great studio. I think it's got it's got a huge potential. And um there's another one, what was it called? Um I think it's called Themisa. I have to remember the the name. But there's a you know, there's a few there's a few of them, you know, coming out from from, from indie. Oh, there's Carter Car Carter, Carton, Carter. It's another. It's a smaller um, mm. indie studio. They've been going around for like three or five years. Um, really good game. It's been released on Switch, published by a Western company, um, Digital Devolver. But again, you know, lots of potential here, and I think that just needs just throw more money at it, throw more support. <laughs> you know, like just just get them get them going um, because it's tough making the games. Game, making games is not easy. No. It's really really hard. So what exactly does Player AM do? <laughs> so um, I would say that we occupy a slightly small niche where we work with 70% um, of our businesses, we work with developers to create uh, pipelines or tool chains for using um, automation or procedural workflows. So that's a fancy way to say that, um, you know, um, we will help developers to create assets that can be... Um, um, automated so in if you if you if you imagine that you have a, a car right yeah um you can you, you can get a bunch of people to, together with screws and bolts and start to you know put put that car together 
But um, if you start to throw in robots when they start to, you know, automatically make the car, then um, you can allow your workforce or your team to focus on more important aspects of the car making. And it's just, it might be a slightly bad analogy, but that's what we do with developers. We tend to um, create um, assets or content. Yeah, game um, content. That yeah. utilizes these procedural or automated workflows where they can automate parts of that production. They can automate parts of that, that process. So um, we started out um, focusing mainly on the material side. So painting, textures, you know, um, uh, when we first started and then we started to move towards um, uh, modeling and the environment and, and these kind of workflows. And um, since then we've been working with quite a few developers where we've been helping them on the back end. So really, really early on in their development pipeline where we're trying to help them to make um, tools or workflows that can speed up their full production mm. process. So we still make the art, we still make the content for them because we need to, so we can help figure out what's the best way to automate this. What are the rules that need to be put in place? What is the steps that we need to do? So, so far it, it sounds like it's kind of like a movie production where they might hire, a, you know, people might see, let's say a Marvel film mm. and they might think, okay, so this is maybe a cooperation between Disney and maybe mm. two, uh, a half dozen FX shops, mm. but actually, a lot of it involves so many people. That's yes. why when you sit through movie credits or video game credits, you're sitting there for like five minutes watching the name <laughs> scroll. Yeah. yeah, And they're all in tiny little font because there's little so font. much yeah. of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's so many. Um, to make it more clear for our listeners who may not be familiar, what parts exactly can be automated? Could you give an example? Mm. Uh, you also said assets. So assets could be, let's say, trees in the background, Correct. the character models, Correct. or perhaps... Uh, you know, village characters in the background mm. moving about, you know, because if you're creating a game and you're spending all that time working on every single last character, yeah. it'll never finish. Yeah. So you're helping making sure that these games can come out on a timely basis. Correct. Uh, I remember waiting. I, it feels like I was a, a three ages younger waiting for a game like Cyberpunk 2077 <laughs> to come out. And, you know, so <laughs> it, <laughs> which... Hopefully it comes out next month. Uh, they said they were considering delays, but anyway, um, <laughs> is there? Can you give an example for our yeah. listeners to kind of understand how how it gets automated? Yeah. So the automation part is the is is the one that's more recent for us. The mm -hmm. the the one we started off with is, was um, the procedural part. But but I'll give you an example of automation part. Um, a lot of time is spent in games just laying out, placing a chair here placing a tree there right so it looks good in a scene yeah yeah and that kind of thing you can actually automate um mm -hmm. so what you would do is you start to define rules um so for example if we take this this room for example uh, i don't know if the listeners can see it maybe not we have a table and we have a couple of chairs and well we know this room is probably like a school or an office right so we can set rules and say well in this room only chairs and tables exist and now the system would know about okay in this room i'm going to only going to place chairs and tables and we can set a rule and say don't put a chair on the table because that's just not going to look good mm. unless you unless that's what you want right so you're specifying these rules and with these rules you can then um give the users kind of buttons or um initiate it on on, on when the level starts and say okay automatically lay it out right um, you've probably seen games where they have um, procedural dungeons. So every time you play a game, it's very mm. different, right? Yeah. So it's similar to that. You're defining the rules of the space and then um, letting the system to um, automatically place them where you, where you feel it looks good. Mm. And you're going to see more and more of that because games are getting so much more bigger. The game is so much more expensive. Yeah. And having someone like, you know, sit there and place the chair here and here and here is maybe not going to be as cost efficient as you want in the future. Mm. It doesn't mean you, they don't get to do it. They can. It's just that now you're focusing on the more important aspects of the placement. You might want to, you might want to place something somewhere um, as a part of the story um, to oh. communicate a metaphor. So you go in and you say, I want this right here. You can still empower them, but now you've got more time to focus on that kind of stuff rather than, okay, we've got to lay out all hundred, 110 of these chairs you know 
<laughs> so that's an example of some of the automation um, part. There's more, um, but that's that's a, a more simpler one. The the procedural part that I talk about is um, in the early days, you you kind of be um, kind of painting textures by hand, you yeah, know, like using Photoshop and so on. Um, but you can you can now, or what we've been doing with with a lot of our clients is um, making these procedural materials where they're little bits of information that describe an object. So for example, if you have a remote control, right? Yeah. You know that the remote control has plastic and you know it's got rubber on the buttons. So um, by assigning what we call an ID, which is a color code uh -huh. to the object, you can then automatically place the appropriate textures on it. Mm. So if you, if you then um, create an ID robust enough for your entire assets or world or category of assets maybe it's just for guns right mm -hmm. now all of a sudden you can automatically texture all your guns oh okay you see you see or, or like swords so you don't have to manually draw every single last Correct. blade it'll figure it out exactly so yeah. what we do is we sit down and we look at we look at uh we work with a client we look at their 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 design and their world and we say okay well it looks like all of these swords are the same category so if we create these rules, we could probably just automatically texture all of them for you. And if you've got, you know, 500 swords, right, that you need to texture because you want to sell, you know, 500 of them, right. or just put them out there. <laughs> or like as, a gotcha game where you have all these variants of, of so-called yeah. upgradable weapons. Exactly. Now you, you've, just, you've just automated that. But what that requires is really good levels of planning and pre-production. And not many studios... Um, have that and sometimes we sit with them to help them through that but you know those were in the early days now you know a lot more studios are using these workflows you know yeah. now a lot more studios are like oh wow this is definitely a way that they want to go and some studios are doing a really great job about it right so that's a, those are some examples of like procedural um, aspects and that procedural aspect is not can can be applied both for the texturing so like painting but it can also be applied for the modeling as well, mm -hmm. the physical geometry. And that's something that we've also been, um, been building up as well. Mm -hmm. So we have procedural workflows and then going into the automation. Automation. Yeah. That sounds great because one of the issues playing games like uh, Mass Effect one or two is you start noticing the same heads and bodies <laughs> over everybody and it's just a mix mash of the yeah. uh, and you're like oh, i've seen this guy before and they might have a somewhat different voice but it's the same alien mm. right so uh you know hopefully with uh yeah. playroom's help then you, you won't have you know there'll be more variety every character mm. will look unique and yeah. that's cool that's very yeah, cool yeah. stuff and like i said you know making games is hard and yeah. um um it does require like sitting down and planning. So a lot of times we are very, very early, like, you know, with the developer working, working with them. Um, some games, you know, it works. And for certain other types of games, sometimes it can be the, the, the you, sometimes it just does not quite work out the way we would, we would, we would like it to work out. But for them, but that's, you know, that could be mainly because of the game's unique visuals. Um. Sometimes it's just hard to break down a visual style into its um, basic fundamental rules that can then facilitate a procedural workflow or an automated workflow. Oh. But I guess it's it's your expertise that brings it about. Mm. Thank you. Are you guys developing any of your own games? Yes. Yeah. So um, we uh, just released uh, GeoRifters under a sub brand. Uh -huh. called Busy Toaster Games. Busy Toaster. Yeah. Toaster yeah. like ka-ching and toast pops out. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Can we find out why why Busy Toaster? Why Busy Toaster? Be? Yes, there is. If you actually uh, go to the Busy Toaster website, but I'm sorry. Why I, did I you call it Busy it. Toaster? So um, because <laughs> we're always busy uh, making something, right. right? You put bread into a toast in, into a toaster and it comes out as something else. It comes out cooked, it comes out um, as toast, right? Yeah, uh -huh. So it's this idea that we're always taking... Um, something and transforming it into something else. We're always oh. taking a blank canvas and oh. turn it into an idea. And we're always busy doing that. Right. You know, we're, we've always got one idea or another idea. Um, even for our game, Georifters, um, before that game, um, we had like three or four other games that we prototyped, tested, and we were like, no, we're not gonna, we're not gonna go forward with those. We put them mm. in the fridge. Uh, never throw an idea away, but we, we put that one in the fridge. 
And um, for for Georifters, it was a chance for us to, you know, stretch our creative muscles. We, mm. we created a separate team, separate brand. So we um, don't step on the, our client's toes. You know, PlayRM is its own thing. Right. We're working with developers, whereas Busy Toaster is creating original IP, origi- original games. Mm. So it's, a, it's created here with the Taiwan team. Mm. We, um, we worked on it from 2017 and um, released it uh, on the Xbox and Steam and Switch um, a few months ago. We're currently now localizing in a few different languages and preparing some future updates. But it is a it is a it is a real achievement, you know, from the team because you know, as well as working with other clients in their downtime, you know, they move over and help to work on this original game and shipping the game out. You know, getting the game released. You know, the team's done a really great job. Yeah. Well, I, I look for I look forward to trying it out because it is on Steam. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were we were chatting before this, and one of the things that popped up was the labor laws. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. yeah, yeah. And you had you had quite a some interesting things to say about that. <laughs> should, should, should we cap off on, on yeah, yeah, what, what what we mean by the labor laws? Yeah, you better explain that. Oh, okay. <laughs> so um, the labor law I think changes. A year ago, there were labor law changes which required time off for everybody in Taiwan. However, the immediate reaction was that there are several industries that can't accommodate this. A common one would be like a the film industry, for instance. They could probably, maybe if they're lucky, they could get a location for 14 days. But if the law guarantees that they must be able to take, let's say, four days off during those two weeks, then it, make it may make it impossible for them to film because there's crunch time and whatever. Same thing for video games, especially near deadline. There are going to be you know, games that need to come out exactly on this date before the holidays. There can't be any delays. So how has that affected uh, Playurium? Yeah, so yeah, we were talking about this a little bit <laughs> earlier. And um, it's pretty interesting because, um, I mean, I'm the CEO and founder, right? And yeah. um, I'm, I'm pretty much almost always working. Do, you know, do I, how do I give myself you know, two days off and... If I don't, do I do I do I sue myself? I will grant you. I will <laughs> <Right>? grant you. <laughs> Benediction. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think that um, I understand. You know, the government is trying to protect people, and they want to ensure that companies are held accountable to in- make sure that their employees have a good work-life balance. I I understand that, but I think that there could be a more nuanced approach to it because different industries have different requirements. And I think on an industry per industry basis, there should be, maybe they can introduce um, industry specific labor law regulations rather than a one stock fits all. Um, if we look at things like in the West where you have like maybe um, Christmas holidays coming up, right? right? And you know, everybody wants to buy gifts, everybody wants to travel and it can be difficult for those retailers to find and staff up. I mean, I'm sure they want to, um, maybe some of them do, but um, it can be difficult. And so you introduce overtime, you know, and that's a, at least for me when I was younger, that would be, that was great because I can get extra money. You know, it's like, okay, cool. Overtime hours, you know, it's extra revenue for me. So um, I, I, I think, you know, they, if possible, there should be a more nuanced approach to it. Maybe just um, try to look at the industry and create appropriate rules that balance, you know, protecting the employees, protecting people's health, as well as um, ensuring that the industry can still be profitable, to still that, that the industry can still be competitive, right? Yeah. To, to still um, ensure that industry is not held back in one way or another. I think there's a middle ground somewhere. I don't know what, but I think there's a middle ground there. There should be. Yeah. yeah. yeah there, there, I, I do know that several industries did get together, like the film industry, to create exceptions. Mm. Uh, maybe the gaming industry, the fledgling gaming industry in Taiwan, <laughs> will, <laughs> will combine together and explain that there are certain times where, you know, crunch time is a reality and mm. so forth. And get that working. Yeah, you've, yeah. you've been working here a while now. What do you see as the, the potential or the, you know, the advantages of the local gaming industry? What, what are they maybe neglecting or not? Or you know, what can they do to develop more? I think um, a lot of the games that I've seen um, coming out in the past five years have been, you know, um, because X 
developer in Taiwan liked this game, they wanted to make their own version. So it's either a copy of a, of a copy or a homage. Sorry, a, a copy is too, too derivative. <laughs> um, and or they want to make a game that is, you know, focusing on the Japanese market, um, which is also quite hard to crack. Or they or they only focus on the China market, right? And um, I think there's been some great games that have come out. You know, things like Detention, Implosion, a lot of the Rayarch stuff um, that has been released. But a lot of the indie um, developers, I think, um, um, can dip into more of the culture of Taiwan. Um, I'm going to use Japan as an example. You know, sometimes when you play a Japanese game. You can see sometimes they dip into um, cultural aspects of Japan mm. and explore it very thoroughly. You know, like there's many different styles of games that have really interesting um, exploration of, of Japanese culture. And I think that um, Taiwan does have a wide range of different cultures. I was mentioning before about the um, the Aborigine. Um, yeah, think, yeah, the right? Aboriginal culture. The Aborigine culture, um, you know, there's a lot of rich cultural aspects there. And you look at games like Horizon Zero Dawn, Assassin's Creed, where they do dip into these very rich cultures and explore them, right? I think there's definitely something there. I, um, I think Taiwan also has this, um, this um, what do you call it? They're, they're giant mannequins and they walk along the streets what it, what is that? Um, you mean like religious processions? Where yes. Oh yeah, like yeah. Matsu. Oh, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. The there's puppets, the puppets, yeah, right. yeah and you all know, that stuff. A lot of Budai stories. Shi. Yeah. yeah, exactly. There's a lot of stories um, from there, and I'm pretty certain that Taiwan must have some fairy tales or some other types of you know uh, books and, and and cultures there. So, so I think there's a lot here in Taiwan that can still be pulled from. There's a there's a lot of untapped cultural. Um, resources right. that can be pulled right. from, right? But, um, you know, it's still early days and um, Taiwan is, I, I've been told, is a, it's a safe place. It tends to be, <laughs> tends to play things very, very, very safe. Right, right? yeah. And, um, and if they do create something, it's about persecution, how they're being persecuted in one way or another. And I just think that, you know... Um, That's an interesting take. Yeah, there's... there's um, there's nothing wrong with those. I just think that there's more options available for them to pull from to create unique experiences. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, there's a lot of richness here, you know. For sure. I think uh, Taiwanese are often, they've been taught really to look elsewhere, you know, and they don't they don't look at the so many wonderful things that go on here. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean... Uh, so games like uh, Ghost of Tsushima I yes. think, is really Japanese oriented. It, there's even a mode that makes it look like it's uh, Akira Kurosawa. Akira Kurosawa flick, like no way. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there, which is in black and white and everything. Yeah. Um, and then I run like one of the best selling games out of Taiwan is Detention. Uh, again, that covers some of the period. Yeah, the, the white, white terror, terror period. Yeah. Uh, martial law in Taiwan. Uh, I do think. You know, as Solomon said, there is a lot of games that could come out of Taiwan that we would grab people's interests by getting that cultural aspect. We don't have a big. Um, there's n there's not a lot of cultural exports the way there is for Korea. There's not that whole uh, yes, or Japan. Yeah. There's not that whole cultural marketing complex yeah. that they have. We somehow lack that. But that's but why it's, I it's say it's built up though. That yeah, was yeah. built up like South yeah. Korea in the nineteen yeah. nineteen nineties nineteen eighties. I believe government officials in South yes. Korea were just tired because anime was everywhere. Yes, and they or, and. Japanese dramas and they said we need to create our own so they yeah. put in money into that uh, in 2016 actually the Thai administration as well as uh, local educators actually came together to build some schools uh, one I think is a media school name I, I is not a, not on the top of my head which are building the next generation of Taiwanese designers uh, potentially game developers and so on uh, uh, for this kind of for this purpose so Taiwan could have a soft power and games are indeed a very important cultural mm. soft power yeah and that's yeah. exactly what I was saying before which is you know the government um, has to throw in more money I mean I, I still think that um, I, I, I didn't know about the um, the, the thing about um, the Thai administration um, there yeah that's that wasn't announced very loudly but they right, started right. initiatives to, so there's a media school in Taipei now right. where that's just only in its third year i mm. think that one of our 
yeah that that's the uh that's pur- the purpose is to yeah, yeah build that yeah because a lot of the subsidies and the money that uh, i've seen being offered and flown around is either you know you need to put in the same amount and <laughs> if you're a small indie developer how can you afford that right it's it's very hard wait what is dad be- for <laughs> that's yeah. what dad is for <laughs> <laughs> they, they, it definitely um investment is very important yeah. because looking at the k wave they've the government has earned their money back yeah, yeah for Japan sure definitely has earned its yeah. money back that's yeah. why every single major city from fukuoka yeah. to whatever they will invest they'll give game developers yeah. their own space yeah even places to live in for free if you have a good idea or you have somewhat of a small track record mm. you can bring your development there yeah. at no cost to fukuoka yeah i know i should be advertising taiwan here but we don't <laughs> have an equivalent no yeah. we, we don't need, we need to have a same equivalent yeah and here. another example is like sometimes when they do offer you subsidy or grant it's you know it, they will take a certain percentage of your company you know and ah. and, and, and i think that um it's fine but i but um, there also needs to be other options, you know, yeah. and you just you just brought up all of these examples is exactly what I mean, which is um, other places like um, Japan, like Korea. And there's um, I believe also Australia has also introduced like um, subsidies, grants um, um, to really build up the industry. UK has the I think, believe it's the creative um, grants and um, uh, US has some. I mean, it's it's uh, and also Canada. I think Canada also yes. has some some um, subsidies there so i think that um uh, they just they just needs to be more thrown out and, and the benefits are long term uh, i'm glad you brought up the example about the uh, the k wave because you know um if we only look at it short term then it's not gonna bring back anything but if you look at it long term you know you could end up being where korea and japan is right now with their cultural exports yeah. yeah. So yeah, you know, I've been I've been a teacher like the whole of my time here, and I was thinking of all my poor students who were being forced by their parents to be doctors when <laughs> what they really wanted to do was develop computer games. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I was wondering, like, what kind of people do you hire? What do you look for when you hire people? Um, well, the first thing we look for is the, is is the right fit within the team because um, making games is hard. It's 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 really really hard, and you need to work and communicate with different people, and not just like different people on your team, but different people on other teams. You might need to communicate with a programmer, you might need to communicate with a producer or a designer, and each of these different groups of people have their own different ways of of communicating, of <laughs> of, of thinking. Right. So we do need people who um, are very good communicators, high level of um, you know uh, emotional intelligence. And, and fit the team. And, you know, we always, making the games, you always got to have each other's backs. So, you know, we try to avoid politics in our team. And it's always going to be there, but we try to avoid it. But we, we always stress how it's important for each other to make sure to do the thing that the other person needs, you know, support them um, and be creative, offer your ideas, offer your support. And that's just on the kind of soft skills, right? Um, on the technical side, uh, depending on what you want to do on, or, or, or the aspect that you want to be in, um, whether you want to be a 3D artist or animator or a designer or a programmer, um, you, you, you've got to make sure that your, your skill level is up to scratch. Um, luckily, there's a lot of tutorials on YouTube. <laughs> you know, it's not like when I was younger. I mean, now you can you can learn a lot on YouTube, and not just YouTube. You can learn a lot on Twitch. I've seen people do live stream of coding, and they're just coding but explaining how they're doing their code. You know, or whether they're doing um, 3D sculpting. Like there's there is, I would like to say there is not really excuse these days for you not to know the thing you need to know right. because there's so much out there for right. you to that resources for you to to pull from. So uh, definitely try to get your skill level, your technical skill level up. Um, we have taken people on who have been junior and have shown potential and have trained them up. Uh-huh. And that's, I would say that's few and far between. You know, we, we do interview them quite rigorously to make sure that they fit because if we're, if we're going to invest our time and effort and energies in them, we want to make sure that, you know, these people are the one you know, like the Matrix, yes. Neo, is this the one, <laughs> right? You know, um, but then of course, you know, if you've got the skills and the experience, you know, no problem. And we always test people, whether it's a programmer or artist, 
um, we try to do the test to make sure that they can handle the way that we work. Um, and, and it's good for them because they can also see how we potentially might work with them. They might not like us. So <laughs> right. there's always, there's always <laughs> yeah, that. It works right? both ways. Yeah. For, for those who are just aspiring, who are playing these games, uh, many of which you've worked on, and they decided, you know, I want to be a part of this. Because, you know, just like movies, games are even bigger. They have so much of it. How, is there a place where you think they could get started? Mm. Um, definitely online resources. Um, like the YouTube ones like you mentioned? Like YouTubes. You know, there's a lot of good channels. Um, if you're doing art, there's Flip Normals. There's, um, um, the Unreal, if you're using Unreal Engine, there's the Unreal Engine. Whether that's Discord. Discord is also good as well. There's a lot of cool Discord channels where you can go in and people are going back and forth. Um, uh, Twitch as well. You can, you can look for um, people who have got experience in the industry sharing their knowledge. You always have to be careful about people who maybe not don't really have as much experience as you would hope for sharing uh. the knowledge because you might be taught something or you know pick up some habits that might not work for you for or you. for that for that industry so check out their cv first yeah as well. check yeah. it out and just see you know is this the is this where i want to be or is this person got the stuff that I, I need to know right um but definitely online resources um there's also um, places like ArtStation. I'm mainly saying the art stuff because I have an art background, but mm. on the programmer side, um, I, I think that there's a lot of resources on the GitHub. Um, and still, I think YouTube, still I think documentation is there for it. Um, I think there's also this Code Academy. Um, I know one of my engineers uses this thing called Coding Game. So it's like, you, they give you a homework and you've got to, it's like, a, it's a gamification of learned code. Oh, so cool. every month you have to um, code something that gets entered into a competition and um, you get points for it, right? And it gets reset every month and you get a level up as well. Um, from what I've heard, it's meant to be pretty good. Um, there's a few others, I believe as well, but coding game I've heard is meant to be quite good for that. Oh, well, good. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we've had a very fruitful and productive uh, conversation. <laughs> oh, we, we didn't get enough to talk about how uh, all those games you play, Trenton. Well, all the games I play? Yeah. yeah what are you playing I'm now, still, I'm, I'm still trying to get... Con I'm still trying to understand Master of Orion, okay? <laughs> <laughs> uh, just give it another 30 years. <laughs> uh, what, Solomon, what are some of your favorite games? Or what are you oh, playing right now? Oh, right now? Um, okay, so... <laughs> I'm actually still playing uh, Monster Hunter World. Oh. Yeah, yeah. There's a few expansions that just came out, which I, I haven't been able to jump onto, but I, I've been playing Monster Hunter World. And I just um, started up on the Avengers um, mm -hmm. as well. And I've been I've been playing a bit on my on the Apple Arcade. I'm playing a game called uh, Grindstone. I oh. really, really like the music on that. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm enjoying it. Um, Past couple of months because of um, there was the Taipei uh, sorry Tokyo Game Show and uh, <laughs> not, to be confused. not to be confused that's the other TGS yeah it's not the TGS you know? <laughs> so we were busy like preparing for that and a few other game shows so so um, I wasn't able to play as much as as, as I would have liked but Monster Hunter World Grindstone and um, Avengers those are those are what, some. Are, what are you looking forward to <sighs> what am I looking forward to. I have to say, um, I am looking forward to um, Cyberpunk. And um, there's a few old games that I'm looking forward to. Um, I'm still, I haven't completed Arkham Asylum, Arkham Knight. Oh, Batman, Arkham Knight. oh yeah. Arkham, Arkham That's games. a very yeah. good Batman game. Yeah, yeah. yeah I've, I'm, 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 I know I'm at the end. I know I'm at the end. And um, I just, I'm, look, I'm actually looking forward to going back to that. I really, really like those games um, a lot. Um, and let me think, I think, um, oh, I, I recently picked up Ring Fit, so I'm looking forward to <laughs> actually playing that. I unboxed it, but it, I haven't played it. It's very valuable right yeah. now. You know? It's selling for, I have one too. <laughs> 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 then I looked at the prices now, and I'm like, I'm trying to decide if I should sell it or keep it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. awesome. What, about, what about you? What are you, uh, what are you playing? Me, of course, Cyberpunk. I'm waiting for that. Uh, I'm waiting for the reviews to come in for Baldur's Gate 3. Oh, nice. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm an yeah. old school, uh, you know, digital D&D &D kind of player. Sure. Um, <laughs> but there's so many things coming up recently yeah uh, uh, a lot of great and games. there's all these great uh, uh elite dangerous has
has a new update called Beyond coming. Uh, other space games, Star Citizen. I've been waiting that. Uh, I think it's going to be ready by the time I am in my deathbed. So, uh, <laughs> uh, that'll always be fantastic too. You know, I, I noticed that you're wearing a DreamHack and oh, a yeah, there yeah, in yeah. February. Yes, we were. Oh, we so were. Playroom. So where can other people find your next projects for Playroom in the future? <sighs> Well, keep watching our website, keep following us on social media. So Playerium, look for us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or go to our website. There are some updates coming in the next couple of uh, days or so, well, days, no, sorry, um, months, I would say, mm -hmm. because a lot of times we're working on games that are not going to be shipped for a long, long time. Oh, true. And yeah. so we can't say anything um, <laughs> about it. Um, but... Um, Keep following us on the social media and websites and we'll slowly um, drip that out. For the dream hack, um, we were there showing Dream Rifters um, for the first time in the US. So we wanted to get like, you know, the viewpoints of American um, players, see what, oh. they, see what they feel about the game. And that was great. We picked up an award there for the game, uh, best casual game at DreamHack Anaheim. So that was, that was nice. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well. Thanks very much for uh, stopping in today. It's been wonderful talking with you. Yeah, no, I love talking about this, and I'll be happy to come back if you guys would have me. We do. There's a lot of games to talk about. <laughs> yeah. This has been brought to you by the Taiwan Report. For more content like this, become our patron at report.tw.